you are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, T.W., flying solo for now. BQ will be back with us when he's back with us. But in the meantime, I'm going to hold us down, all right? So before we get started, just do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, there's a lot of great content that comes on this channel. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Give us a nice little boost so that everybody around YouTube knows that this video was dope, that you loved it, all right? Um, Feel free to share it with a friend, right? Go ahead and do that. And hit the notification button so that you get a notification each and every time we drop some dope new content for this channel, all right? Go ahead and do that for your boy. Uh, I'll wait. Okay, so the top story going around the wrestling world today is not directly coming out of Impact Wrestling, but it does affect Impact Wrestling. And that is a report in the Wrestling Observer that Nick Khan of WWE has been negotiating with New Japan Pro Wrestling to make WWE New Japan's exclusive United States partner. So what that means is that New Japan would no longer work with AEW, they would no longer work with ROH, they would no longer work with Impact Wrestling. So that's obviously uh, pertinent to us as Impact Wrestling fans because, you know, some of those New Japan stars have been really, you know, livening up the Impact Wrestling program. Uh, you know, when Phantasma came in, this guy, definitely a superstar, right? Just uh, a, a scene stealer comes in, definitely um, somebody that you notice right away, right? He, he was one of the most exciting things on Impact Wrestling for the two or so weeks he was on the show. But, um, you know, him... Finjuice, uh, you know, K- Kojima come, came on this week. And all these guys have definitely made an instant impact, no pun intended, on Impact Wrestling. So if AEW and Impact were no longer able to work with New Japan Pro Wrestling, how much would that really hurt the show? Now, in my opinion, although the New Japan stars have definitely added something to Impact Show, I don't know that it would necessarily be that much of a noticeable absence from Impact Wrestling if they stop having New Japan talent. But let's talk about the real issue here, right? The real issue that I have here is that, let's be real, WWE does not want to add New Japan talent. They just want to take New Japan talent away from other promotions. And the fact that I see fans online getting excited about the idea of this is crazy to me. You know, some of the things I'm hearing, oh, imagine the depth that WWE would have now on the roster. Oh, listen, WWE has the re- the deepest roster in the world right now. Right now. They have access to all the talent in NXT, all the talent in NXT UK, all the talent in Evolve, all the talent in, uh, you know, all the talent on SmackDown, all the talent on Raw, and all the people who are on SmackDown and or Raw that you never, ever see. Think of people like Ricochet, people like Asuka, who's on TV a lot, but, you know, we can definitely have a conversation about how she's used. People like, you know, Shayna Baszler, people like Keith Lee, right? All these people that have gone to WWE, and listen, for them, I'm sure they wouldn't they wouldn't trade off working for WWE because they're making the most money they've ever made in their life, right? So I don't blame anybody for working for WWE. I don't blame anybody for making the most money you can make in your industry. What are you like? Well, you don't like money, you know? But from a fan standpoint, I can't understand how fans would want to have more talent be taken off the market. Have more talent become invisible. Listen, if WWE and New Japan strike up a partnership, that's going to be fun. It's going to be promoted for like a month, maybe two, maybe three. But sooner rather than later, Vince is going to like his show like he always likes it. He's going to want the type of people that he considers marketable on his screen. He's going to want people that can cut promos in English, right, for long periods of time. And we know this because we've seen 
very talented wrestlers who don't necessarily, you know, um, speak speak English as as fluently or as fluidly as Vince McMahon might like. And what happens to them? They disappear off WWE television. So, do you think that Vince is going to fill his show with dream matches from New Japan wrestlers? I doubt it. I highly doubt it. Again, he might do it once or twice, but trust me when I tell you, this is nothing more than a play at taking away something that's making AEW interesting, right? Tony Khan is flaunting calling himself the forbidden door by opening up AEW to working with New Japan, working with Impact, and basically creating a line. I said this a long time ago. This goes back to people talking about the AEW Impact Partnership. Right. And people are saying, oh, this isn't the invasion. And, you know, why is not impact on AEW more? I said then and I'll say it again. It was never about that. This is about AEW positioning themselves as the true alternative to WWE. And while they can't compete with the history and the built in fan base that WWE has, what they can do is say, hey, look at. All this variety of wrestling that takes place all over the world. You want death matches? We got John Moxley. You want J Japanese stars? We got Japanese stars in AEW. And we're going to bring in Japanese stars. You like Mexican stars? We got Thunder Rosa. You like people that are indie-rific? We're going to sign up everybody who makes a hot YouTube video on the indies. You like wrestling companies that are trying to survive? <laughs> We're going to work with Impact Wrestling, right? So this is what it was always about for AEW. It was about positioning themselves as the true alternative to WWE by saying, hey, not only are we here as the alternative, but we're part of a coalition of everybody else except WWE. So you can get over there and you can get this high production value, great wrestling library, you know, history of wrestling that we all grew up on, but very seldom entertaining product, which is WWE. You can have that, or you can come over here and have all the colors of the rainbow, which is AEW plus all the super friends, right? All, all the promotions from all around the world. That's what AEW was always trying to do here. And you know, look, we, we, if there's one thing we know about WWE, right, is that Vince is petty. Vince lives and thrives on petty, right? If you guys saw the AEW, uh, AEW, I'm sorry, the A&E biography that they did on the Ultimate Warrior a few days ago, there was one part that just, just stuck in my mind like a thorn, right? It's the part where the Ultimate Warrior is fed up with a lot of things, and he writes Vince McMahon a letter basically saying, hey, I want to get paid the same as Hogan. And Vince basically said, I told him what he wanted to hear so he would come to work. And I couldn't wait to fire him after it was over. And not only did he, did he say he, didn't want to wait, he couldn't wait to fire him after it was over, he wrote Warrior a letter back and just wrote in, all the things that he knew would stick in Warrior's heart, in his ego, in his psyche. And I was just like, man, this man is the Prince of Petty. Like, this McMahon might be the pettiest human being to ever live, which is crazy. It's wild to me, right? Because he's he's winning, right? He's, he's winning. Like, he's rich. He controls the wrestling business, the history of the wrestling business, but he can't let anything slide. He's just one of those people he just can't let anything slide. And he can't let slide the fact that people are excited about the idea that you can watch AEW and see a product that's different from what Vince offers and it's good and people like it and you have all this variety from all this talent from all around. Vince doesn't like it and he's going to use his money to try and take those options off the market. And you, the fans are falling for it. All right, let's get into the show this week. 
The show started with Sammy Callahan coming out to the ring, taking a chair and sitting right down in the middle of the ring and calling out the AEW slash Impact World Champion Kenny Omega. He tells Kenny Omega, listen, you can prepare for Moose. You can prepare how to counter a spear. You can prepare for Rich Swan. You can prepare for a, flat, a frog splash off the top rope, but you can't prepare for me. Because there's no preparing for getting your head smashed in. Because that's what Sammy Callahan brings to the table. He brings death and destruction and your gruesome violence. Because that's why we love you, Sammy Callahan. You are the death machine. And we love you for it, okay? So, thank you for it. Now, you would think at this point, Kenny Omega would come out to defend his own honor. But instead, the lights drop and Moose comes out. Now, Moose tells... Yeah, not Omega, God. Moose tells Sammy Callahan, I got Kenny Omega on the brain. Moose tells Sammy Callahan, stay out of his business. And he says that until, against all odds, Kenny Omega is Moose's business and not Sammy Callahan's business. So he basically wants to tell Sammy to stay out of his way. So you got Sammy Callahan, you got Moose going back and forth. Blah, 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 blah. And then the good brothers come out. Now, the Good Brothers, as usual, think they're funny. And as usual, they're really not. And these guys, they're, uh, they're mimicking. Um, there's a video that circulated online a few weeks ago where this uh, preacher was just saying some wild stuff about how, you know, if you're a woman, you need to make sure you're always looking good for your man. Praise the Lord. And uh, they were basically mimicking that with their promo style that they were doing here. They were saying, uh, he said, he said, how many times are you guys going to blame the Good Brothers for your mistakes? And then Gallows goes like, praise the Lord. And he says, if uh, if your wife leaves you, are you going to blame the Good Brothers? Praise the Lord. Right? So that type of thing. Anyway. Eventually, the Good Brothers get into the ring, you know, talking that corniness. And they say, hey, you know what, Sammy? We think Moose has a point. We're on Moose's side. And Lou Gallows is standing there with his arm kind of around Moose. And Moose says, <laughs> you know, that's good, but I'm not on your side. And he sucker punches the Good Brothers. Brawl breaks out. And the Good Brothers go, 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 go scattering back up the ramp. Backstage, we get Don Callis, who runs to the Good Brothers. And he makes a match between... The Good Brothers, and Moose and Sammy Callahan for later that night. This leads in to an interesting segment. Backstage, we get Mean Gia interviewing Don Callis, basically saying, hey, is that match you made official? And he's like, why wouldn't that match I made be official? Because I'm an EVP around here, right? Like, he's making it a point to emphasize I'm an EVP around here. And... She says, the crowds, just, uh, the, the audience, we're, we're just not used to seeing you make matches. And then Scott Demore comes in and he basically says the same thing, right? Like, oh, hey, it's nice to see you actually doing something around here, right? And <clears throat> these guys just kind of, you know, talking slick back to each other a little bit. And so they're really emphasizing, they're really playing up that there is a rift going on between Don Callis and Scott Demore, So that's certainly something that they're building to. If you've heard the news, if you've been paying attention to the rumor mill going on, it looks like what Impact is going to try to do is give the fans a, a an on-camera story ending to, you know, actually write Don Callis off of Impact TV. And to me, I think that's great because in the history of, of Impact, you know, we're used to all this dysfunction around the company. So the fact that they're taking, you know, a real life change and they're going to just take the time to make sure we get to see it play out via storyline on TV, to me, that's dope. That's dope. And again, it emphasizes that this company is a little more stable from a management standpoint than it has been in times yeah. past. TJP and Followed By, long time tag team, reunited. I don't even know why they were broken up, but they're back together now. And so it was TJP and Fala Ba against Josh Alexander and Petey Williams. Why? Just because, right? <laughs> and uh, high quality wrestling all over the place here. The finish came when Fala Ba hit Josh Alexander with a Samoan drop. TJP followed up with the 
Mamba Splash, and he pinned Josh Alexander for the one, two, three. And my first reaction here was, why? Why are you pinning your X Division champion? Why? I, I don't understand this. Why pin your X Division champion? There was another guy in the match, Petey Williams. You could have pinned Petey Williams, but instead you have your X Division champion take a clean pin one, two, three in a tag match. I just, I, I, I don't understand it. If this guy is supposed to be your champion, you want to keep him looking strong. So why have him take the pin? Why? That just didn't make sense to me. Um, actually, we'll find out why later in the show. Just, just stay, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay with me here. Stay with me here. But the next thing on this show was, I gotta say, it, it was, it was, it was phenomenal. So, Gia Miller interviewed W. Morrissey, who you guys all know as Big Cass or Cass XL or whatever, and. This promo that he delivered was the best thing I've ever seen from him. It was more entertaining than anything I saw from Cass and Enzo. Like, this automatically made me a believer. So, here's what we got. Gia Miller is interviewing him, you know, asking him, uh, you know, how you doing? It's great to see you. And he just cuts her off. He's like, yeah, I'm going to say it's great to see you. But just like everybody in the wrestling business, I'm going to bury you behind your back. I don't really want to be here. I don't really care if you're here. I don't care if anybody's here. I just want to say what I got to say. And he goes on to say, everybody in the wrestling industry is fake. And when he was at his worst, nobody was there for him. He says that every time he made headlines for all the wrong reasons, people kicked him while he was down. When he had a seizure in front of a crowd of 1,500 people in Philadelphia, fans took out their phones and instead of calling 911, they recorded it and put it on YouTube. He says that everyone in the locker room laughed at him. And for three years, no one in the wrestling business contacted him. Then when he came back, everyone told him, hey man, I'm happy to see you back. I always knew you were going to come back strong. He says when he made it to the top of of, of the company, when he makes it to the top of the industry, everybody is just going to want them on their side. Gia Miller says, hey, I think there actually are some friends in the wrestling business. As a matter of fact, Rich Swan came out to help Willie Mack because that's his best friend. Morrissey says Rich Swan came out to help Willie Mack because he knew that's what the people wanted. And he did that for himself. He says if Willie Mack was gone tomorrow, Rich Swan wouldn't care. He says the same people that when I was at my lowest point, they laughed. When they when I cried, they laughed. And they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. But who's laughing now? Then the camera zooms in on his face. It's this cold stare, this angry look on his face. And then BAM! Rich Swan's foot comes out of nowhere and kicks Morrissey in the face. And Gia Miller got up and ran out of there. Like, literally like a fight just broke out. Like, if you guys have ever been in a place and a fight breaks out and you see the way people just go running for their life. Like, you know what I mean? She, and she did, man. She played that off so good, man. She just, she got up running. It was, it was, man. Oh, man. She... That was the best selling I saw on this whole show. Like, she got up and she took off, man. She's like, oh, no, security, help. <laughs> and Rich Swan, listen, Rich Swan, Rich, Rich Swan sold me on Rich Swan. Now, I have a feeling that because Morrissey is the new guy here, that this program is designed to help uplift Morrissey, but... I don't know, man. I don't know. Listen, I'm so, I'm interested in Rich Swan. When I saw this, when I saw Rich Swan attack Morrissey, then the security did the pull apart, and Rich Swan is, you know, just going crazy, wanting to get back at Morrissey. It made me ask the question, is Rich Swan a top guy? Now, a lot of you may, may automatically be saying no, or you might have been saying yes, or whatever you thought about but let me tell you what a top guy is. I learned what a top guy is from John Cena. John Cena's run in the WWE from 
I don't know, whatever that was, 2006, 2008, all the way up through whatever that was, you know, 2017, 2018 when he really left. Like, he was basically the only guy on top. But he didn't always have the title. And that's when I knew what a true top guy in the wrestling business was. A top guy is a guy who is an attraction, whether or not they have the belt. That's a top guy. And Rich Swan in this moment became an attraction. I want to see what happens with Rich Swan versus W. Morrison. I want to see if Rich Swan, the smaller guy, but former world champion, can battle, can overcome his loss and battle this guy that's twice his size. I want to see that. I'm invested in what's going to happen with Rich Swan, And that makes me ask, is Rich Swan in and of himself the attraction? If he is, then you got to say that's the top guy. Is that not a top guy? Why don't y'all tell me? Drop that in the comments below. Tell me, is Rich Swan a top guy? Is Has Rich Swan become a headliner in your eyes? Has Rich Swan become the reason that you will watch a show or check for a match because you want to see what's happening with Rich Swan? I want to know. I want to hear this from you. But... This is not to take away from W. w Morrissey because, like I said earlier, this is the best promo I've ever seen from him. This is the, to me, this was the type of promo that makes a career. This is going to be the type of thing that people reference back about this guy no matter where he is in his career. They're going to reference back to this as the moment they saw this guy. They stopped seeing him as big cast. They're going to say this is the moment they stopped seeing him as the guy who was having these problems that he referenced, right? Some people might call him a washout or, you know, or, or, or somebody who let his demons get the best of him. If he continues to climb, people are going to look back at this promo as the moment that he turned his career around because this was dope. This was the type of thing you build a character around. This was the type of thing you build a career around. This is the type of thing you build pay-per-view money matches around. So this was perfect because everybody came out of this looking good. It didn't matter who got their face kicked or who got beat up or whatever. Both of these guys came out of this promo, came out of this segment looking way more interesting. So Rich Swan, W. Morrissey, this was this was absolutely perfect. I definitely want to see what's to come next from the two of them. And I'm, I'm also curious as to what, you know, where Rich Swan is in his contract with Impact. Because, right, that's the way they usually do it. They'll give you the world title and heat you up, and then you'll lose it, and you'll put somebody over on the way out the door. That's the way Impact has, has had a pattern of kind of doing things. And it feels like that's what they're doing right now. But... I got to tell you, man, I got to tell you, I didn't feel like I'm done with Rich Swan as a character when I saw this angle. It didn't make me feel like, oh, Rich is on the way out the door. He's going to get smashed by Morrissey, and then I don't need to see anything more from him. Like, no, I feel like I feel like there's a lot left for Rich Swan to do, uh, not in terms of goals to achieve, but I think there's something to be said of having a run of just being a top guy. You don't have to necessarily climb your way back up the ladder, but no, now you've made it to the top of the ladder. Like you're at the top of the card. And I want to see what Rich Swan can do as an established player. Like when Impact goes back on the road, now Rich Swan is a former world champion. He's somebody that we've all seen it. And are we going to be able to see Rich Swan versus W. Morrissey in front of fans? David versus Goliath. Redemption story versus redemption story. I mean, listen, man, I, th I think there's a lot left. There's a lot of meat left on the bone here. And I got, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. What is Impact going to do with this going forward? The knockouts portion of the show. Start off by a video package of the knockouts with different knockouts from the division, all talking about the things that they feel make this division unique, make it special, make it must see, kind of the things that made them inspired to be part of the Knockouts division. It's a pretty cool video package. I'm sure you can find it on Impact's Twitter account or on YouTube somewhere. Um, <clears throat> from there, backstage, we got Mean Gia 
interviewing <clears throat> Rachel Ellering, um, Tennille Dashwood, Havoc, Rosemary, and their f- supposedly fifth partner, T- uh, not Tennille Dashwood, Taylor Wilde was missing. So Rachel Ellering says, hey, we can ask Jordan. And Jordan Grace just happens to walk up and Rachel asks Jordan if she wants to be a part of the match. And Jordan kind of feels a little bit slighted, like, hey, oh, what am I, a substitute? And she's like, no, 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 it's not like that. But it kind of is like that. So (laughs) reluctantly, Jordan agrees, and she's going to be their partner. So we go to the ring, and we got fire and flavor. And uh, Deanna Perrazzo and Kimberly and Susan against all those people I just named. Uh, Rachel Ellering, Jordan Grace, Tennille Dashwood, Rosemary, and Havoc. Are you impressed that I remember that off the top of my head? You should be impressed. That was impressive. Did you remember it off the top of your head? No. So the in this match, they made it a point to show several miscommunication spots between Jordan Grace and Rachel Ellering, obviously teasing more of Jordan kind of turning heel on Rachel Ellering. And the finish of this match came when Rosemary put her double underhook face buster on Deanna Perrazzo and pins Deanna Perrazzo in the middle of the ring. And so, for the second time on this episode, you pinned your world a a champion in the middle of the ring with a clean finish. And I just don't understand why do that. Why pin your champion? And again, I understand why you do it. You do it so that you can set up Later in the show or next week, you can say, oh, this person pinned the champion in a tag team match. Let's give them a one-on-one match, which makes sense. But, I mean, listen, nobody's been kept stronger than Deanna Peraza, so this doesn't hurt her at all. I just don't understand the what's good about pinning your champion. Your champion's supposed to look like somebody who is just super strong, and that makes it all the more... Uh, gratifying when somebody beats them for their title. So having them get pinned, even though it's in a tag team match situation, we're still seeing this person get pinned. So, I don't know, it's just a weird method to me. There's a lot easier way to build up a challenger for a title. You just have to let us see that person winning matches. So if we see Rosemary winning matches on TV for a month in a row, then it's so much easier to say, hey, Rosemary is now the number one contender for the title. Why would she be the number one contender for the title? Because she's been beating people up for the last month. Oh, that makes sense. Instead, you have to actually pin your champion on TV because you wouldn't take the time to just build up the challenger properly. It's it's lazy. It's lazy. It's lazy, and you can do better for the fans. The fans would be way more interested in a match between two people who look like they can't lose than having one person who can't lose, lose cleanly against somebody who looks like they shouldn't be beating them. So, I don't know. It, there's just there, there's got to be a better way to put together, uh, you know, challenges. We see Josh Alexander cutting a promo, and he gets interrupted by TJP. They're going back and forth. TJP's like, hey, man, I pinned you. Josh Alexander's like, yeah, I'm going to take on all challengers. And the ever-present Scott Demore comes in and makes a match. Of course, right? TJP pinned Josh Alexander, clean one, two, three in the middle of the ring. TJP has the right to ask for a shot. And Scott Demore is going to make that match. And not only does he make a match, he says the two of them look like they can go all night long. And he says, since we don't have all night long, how about an hour? Hmm. So he's making a... One hour, 60 minute Iron Man match between TJP and Josh Alexander. Sign me up. I can't wait to watch Impact next week and watch the 60 minute Iron Man match between. Wait, what? What'd you say? What? It's, it's not on. But Impact is the, the flagship. All the spot. Okay, so apparently I'm being told that he didn't make the match for Impact. He made it for BTI. BTI. Not Impact. 
not your flagship show, you are going to put, I guarantee, the only 60-minute Iron Man match on television next week, and you're putting it on BTI. Make it make sense, people. Make it make sense. Like, are you, do you want people to watch this show? I know you want people to watch BTI, but like, give me a fucking break. You think people, uh, you would rather put this match at 7 o'clock than at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock? It, it doesn't make sense to me. It does not make, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, I don't get it. But this wasn't the only promo that we got. We had some great promo work on this show, and it continued with a video package about the feud between Rohit Raju and Jake something. So we got a video package detailing the history between Jake something and Rohit Raju. And it turns out these guys have actually been partners and friends working together on the indies for years. They showed a lot of still pictures of these guys, you know, working the indies. You know, apparently they tag team, you know, show them like sitting in the bleachers together. And these guys have, you know, a, a personal history together. And then they go to Rohit saying how, you know, Impact caters to you. He's talking to Jake, Jake something. He said, Impact caters to you. Uh, Scott Demore put you over in front, in front of everybody in the ring. Scott Demore treats me like trash. And then Jake something goes back and he says, Rohit, the Rohit you are now is not the guy that I knew. He says, you're, you're arrogant. And you, you're, uh, you know, you're full of yourself. And then they go back to Rohit. And Rohit's like, they're catering you again by giving you the type of match you want. It's a tables match. Then they go back to Jake something. And Jake something's like, when I put you through a table, I'm not just going to shatter your body. I'm going to shatter our past. And they go back to Rohit. And Rohit's like, you're going to give me my damn respect. And this was good. This was Good. I don't know why they don't let Rohit talk more. You know, Rohit is one of those guys that he's he's had to prove himself in the eyes of the fans, and I'm sure in the eyes of management too. But every time they've given him something to good, something good to do, he's knocked it out of the park. When they gave him the X Division title, he knocked it out of the park. And so I think Rohit has earned the the opportunity to be presented more seriously. He cuts a damn good promo. Give that man the mic. Let him get some time to talk. And it's funny because it seems like, you know, just about a year ago, we were sitting here saying how, how dare you expect anybody to take Rohit Raju and the Desi Hit Squad seriously. But look at that. You give us a year of taking somebody seriously. And just like that, Rohit is a different player, man. Rohit is a different player. This guy can talk. He looks like a million bucks. He can wrestle. Listen, Rohit Raj, Raju, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he ends up in, in a main event slot at some point because um, he can do it all. And this promo was a great example of that. Rohit, Raju, and Jake something next week in a tables match. I'm here for it. Gia Miller backstage interviewing the doctor, the, the ever-present doctor, who's, you know, just there for anything. I'm pretty sure that guy works in, like, uh, promotions or PR or something for Impact. But they use him on TV as a doctor. And uh, Gia Miller is interviewing him, asking for an update on Matt Cardona's injuries. If you remember on last week's show, Brian Myers was backstage saying how he was upset that Matt Cardona took what he thought was his opportunity to be in the six-way match at Under Siege and didn't even win. So he saw Matt Cardona in the hallway, knocked him out, rammed his face into a wall, and snatched his chain off. And this week, the doctor says that Matt Cardona has sustained damage to, I believe, his orbital bone, and he's going to be out for at least 12 weeks. So that was their way of writing Matt Cardona off TV. I'm totally fine with it. I don't need to see anything else from Matt Cardona. He's, you know... If you want to come back and do something else, fine. But I certainly don't need to see anything else from Matt Cardona. Um, Matt Cardona, in my opinion, his best purpose serve was to help elevate Brian Myers, who's someone that I think has a chance to be like a serious main event player in Impact Wrestling, but it takes time. And he's doing that. He's doing that. And what we saw here 
what we saw here was the doctor gives the update on Matt Cardona. Then Brian Myers comes in and starts cutting his own promo. Then he looks towards the back of the, of the room and he sees Sam Bill. Now, if you guys have been watching, Sam Bill has kind of been used in an enhancement role. But I thought it was interesting that he had, you know, like entrance music and had like a video. And I'm like, this guy's like an enhancement talent. Like, you know, why are they giving him, giving him uh, more of a presentation? But apparently, you know, that was just kind of introducing to the audience and set up this opportunity that we see here. So um, <clears throat> Brian Myers walks to the back of the room. He sees Sam Bill and he tells him he looks stupid and he should slap those stupid tattoos off of him. But he said instead of doing that, he's going to give him an opportunity. And immediately I had flashbacks to Brian Myers and Matt Cardona as the edgeheads. Uh, when they were basically Edge's goons on SmackDown back in the day. So I thought this was really dope. They're going to give Brian Myers a chance to basically assume the leadership role having his own goon. And listen, in the world of WWE, having a goon means that you're about to be champion for a while. Now, this isn't WWE, but having a goon is a type of storyline that you can breathe a lot of life into, that can breathe a lot of life into multiple careers. So if they're going to give Sam Bill to Brian Myers as his lackey, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think that's the type of storyline <clears throat> you can do a lot with. You can do a storyline with just how bad he's treating this guy. And then eventually, you know, Sam Bill will, you know, try to come up and, 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 and you know, break free from Brian Myers. So I'm interested to see where they're going to go with that. I definitely have wanted to see more out of Sam Bill. So this is dope. I'm looking forward to this. I think this can be... Uh, a good part. Violent by Design it. promo. Eric Young and Violent by Design come out to the ring. And this is the part where Eric Young basically does the supervillain monologue, right? He explains their whole evil plan. And he explains how he put the whole team together, why he picked Diener, and why he picked Joe Doring, and why he picked Rhino, and how calculated it was for them to save the Call Your Shot trophy until the right moment to cash it in on Finn Juice. And they did it right at the time when Finn Juice had to go back to Japan so they can't use their rematch clause. And he says this was all by design. And so he's really just hyping up, the, just gloating over the fact that they, you know, pulled off this heist of the tag team titles. And then we get Kojima come out. He's the latest Impact Wrestling, uh, I'm sorry, New Japan Wrestling import to come to, to Impact Wrestling. And he comes into the ring and he just has the microphone and he says... Against all odds, like a, <laughs> it's almost like one of those, uh, you know, movies with the bad subtitles. And um, and Joe Doring just kind of looks at him and nods. And I was seeing some things online that these two actually do have some history. So it makes sense if you have two guys who already know how to work together. And if they can do something good and your audience hasn't seen it before, duh, put them together. So we're going to get Kojima versus Joe Doring at against all odds. We got a match with Decay going against Johnny Swinger and Hernandez. Come on. You know Johnny Swinger and Hernandez not winning a match. Uh, Decay obviously beat them. Then we look backstage and we see Don Callis giving the Good Brothers what appears to be the laziest or worst pep talk ever. I mean, imagine... The pregame speech from any given Sunday where Al Pacino's like, it's about the six inches right in front of your face, right? <laughs> Imagine that. And then think of like the total opposite of that, right? Just totally checked out and like basically, all right, guys, just go out there and win one. And that's pretty much what Don Callis was doing for the Good Brothers. And I would probably say it's had its desired effect. I, I no, I don't know if it did or if it didn't. Um... Because I don't know with a speech like that if you actually want the team you're giving it to to win. But somehow they did. The main event was Moose and Sammy Callahan versus the Good Brothers. And the Good Brothers won. They put the Magic Killer on Sammy Callahan while Moose stood outside the ring and watched. So it was kind of like, you know, what's going to happen next between Moose and Sammy Callahan? Well, we got that answer right away. Moose got back in the ring after the Good Brothers left, and he speared Sammy Callahan, left Sammy Callahan laying in the ring as the show went off the air. 
And so what that tells me is that Sammy Callahan is going to play a role in Moose losing to Kenny Omega at Against All Odds. I did feel like it was too early. Against All Odds just seems way too early for Kenny Omega to be dropping the Impact World title. And so now this kind of gives them an out. Sammy Callahan is going to interfere in the match, and this is going to cause some sort of screw finish, and um, Moose will not be taking the title off Kenny Omega at Against All Odds. Something like that they're going to put on a big pay-per-view, and, you know, it, it should be a big moment that makes a big star for Impact Wrestling. So we'll see where that's really going to go. Really good show top to bottom. The promos on this show were the main event. You're always going to get good wrestling from Impact. But the promos on this show are the thing to see. If you have not seen the show this week, go online and find that Rohit Raju and Jake Something promo to hype up their tables match coming up. Go find, if you don't find anything else, go find the W. Morrissey promo where he's sitting down talking to Mean Gia. I think they got it advertised on their social media with the big words that says, Who's Laughing Now? It's a dope segment. I think that was a career-changing promo by W. Morrissey. And I love the way Rich Swan came in, you know, just putting boots to heads and, uh, and, 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 and letting them know that he's not, you know, he's delivering a receipt for that attack he took last week. So I'm really interested to see where that's going to go. This is a good episode of Impact next week, uh, this week. A lot of story development and it's definitely setting the stage for some big things to happen later this now summer. it's time for the part of the show that you love because you get to be a part of the show. This is from the comment section. So this is where I go into the comments that you leave on the YouTube page and I read them back to you. Not only do I read your comments back to you, not all of them, but I'm just going to pick a few and respond to it. If you guys are dropping some questions, let's see if I can respond to them, give you some answers. Uh, let's see if maybe we can provide some insights. Maybe you guys have some um, some interesting tidbits for me, some things you want me to know. Whatever you do, make sure you drop your name and where you're from right here in the comments down below and let me know what you want to know so that I can give you a shout out and make you guys part of the discussion too. All right, so let's see what we got here. All right, let's see. All right, Bland Skies 28, consistent, consistent viewer of the page. Appreciate you. Says 2018 has been the only good year in impact with Don since he has gone since has gone downhill roster wise and creativity wise. I don't know if I agree with that one, Bland Skies. I don't know if I agree with that one. I mean, listen, I think impact they one thing they've done really well is taking the roster. Let it have a certain amount of time run and then completely turning over the roster. I think that's actually been very impressive. You know, like they've they've had different people on top. They've, you know, been making stars. And listen, I know that the main point of them doing that is so they don't have to actually pay people, right? Like you take an Eli Drake, you let him work for a little while, let him get hot, and then as soon as he's like, pay me, they're like, no. <laughs> and you know they move on to the next person and as a fan you know that kind of stinks for us because we want to have characters that we can invest in right we're investing our time into watching them we want to see this ca character progress and develop but instead it's a new crop every couple of years so yeah the roster's turning over Create creatively i think it's actually been pretty good i think it's i think it's been pretty good and, um, yeah, like Impact to me is one of the better wrestling shows on TV each and every week. So um, I've been a fan of the, of the creative. All right. Malcolm Lloyd says most wrestling sites live in the past and assume Impact Wrestling will never change. That's very true. And a lot of fans see it that way, too. But I would say this. It's incumbent upon the company to change that perception of them. One thing Jeff Jarrett was very good at when he was in charge of Impact Wrestling is trying to get out ahead of the news cycle. He would do things to create news, even if it's something like announcing matches for Impact. He would create the news cycle by putting out little announcements as opposed to letting, you know, let's just say the Meltzers of the world create the news cycle by finding something negative. So, 
it's the job of the company to make sure they're keeping negative news, uh, excuse me, keeping positive news about the, the company circulating, you know, online and, and, and in the news and in the press so that when the name Impact Wrestling comes up, people think something positive and not automatically something negative. I wouldn't blame that all on Don, Don Callis. Uh, Greg Blanton says, TW, your hosting is refreshing, upbeat, and informative. Much needed, just saying. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg Blanton. I appreciate that. Um, if you really enjoy it, bring another friend to the conversation. Send this video over to somebody else who you know is a wrestling fan. Ask them what they think. Tell them to tell me what they think. I want to know. All right? Dregs says, I like this guy. He sees shit I see with these so-called journalists and YouTubers who speak down about, back about impact instead of helping build it up. Luckily, I don't have a promotion, or I would DMCA their channel and force Patreon to end their accounts. I don't even know what half of that means, but it sounded like a compliment, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think it's the job of commentators to help boost the channel. It's not my job to help boost Impact. Impact is not paying me, but Impact, if you do want to pay me, just go ahead and drop me a note, and you know I'll have nothing but good stuff to say about your product. Um, but... I think that my responsibility is to the, the, the viewer. My responsibility is, is for the fans. I think you have a choice when you're going to be in front of the camera, when you're going to be a voice out to the people. You can choose to either be uh, someone who kisses up to the industry or you can be a voice for the fans. And so I want to say the stuff that you guys are thinking, that you guys are feeling, and maybe some stuff that you didn't think and you didn't know you were feeling, right? But maybe I just analyze it with an eye that maybe you weren't, uh, <clears throat> that you weren't necessarily from a point of view that maybe you weren't necessarily considering. But I'm not going to kiss up the impact for tickets. I'm not going to kiss up the impact for a job. I'm going to create content that you guys love. And if you guys love it, then you'll share it. You'll bring more people into the conversation. And if impact wants to talk to me about it, call me. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Malcolm Lloyd says, I'm definitely interested in what Impact is doing with Sammy Callahan. Is he turning babyface or tweener? I'm thinking he'll be the guy to take the championship off Omega. Moose would be awesome to see as world champion, but without any update on his contract, I'm not sure if he'll win. <clears throat> now, I got to say, Malcolm, I agree with you there. I think that... Over the course of the past year, Impact has kind of learned to have some sort of contingency plan in place. Look at what happened with Kylie Ray and Deanna Perrazzo, a match lots of people were excited for, and due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, they had to make an adjustment at the last moment. Luckily for them, they had they had done a little something with Susie and they were able to get her to flip back into Sue Young, and they have that readily on call at any moment if they need if, if they needed a, a substitute, and they just happened to need it at that moment, so that worked out perfectly. Then they had the thing with Tessa Blanchard, and that required you know some shuffling and moving around, but eventually they got that done. And I do think that factors into their planning going forward. So if you look at what they're doing right now, they're kind of setting it up where we see Moose standing right there looking like a contender, and we also see Sammy Callahan sitting right there looking like a contender. So what if the plan was to put the, boost, the, the belt on Moose, and let's say, you know, Moose tears something at the gym. God forbid, God forbid. But, you know, let's say some sort of unforeseen injury happens and Moose is unable to compete. Well, now you've already built up uh, a storyline where Sammy Callahan is right there in position to step in in the event that Moose is unavailable. So I do think that part of it is just a contingency plan, but I'm interested to see where it's going to go because I don't know where it's going to go. You don't know where it's going to go. I hope Impact knows where it's going to go, but I don't know. I don't know. So uh, yeah, I, I, Sammy is right there and I'm sure if something goes wrong with Moose, you know, if the plan is you know, hey, Moose, we'll put the belt on you if you resign. If Moose balks at the resign, then they'll make a switch. It wouldn't be the first time a wrestling company has made a switch at the last moment. All right, let's see. Terp28 says, let's be real. Callus ditched Impact the moment he showed up on Dynamite. So Kenny and the Good Brothers constantly 
punking Impact talent without them fighting back, even on their own show, is good because of a few extra viewers that'll be gone the moment Omega drops the belt. What other way are we supposed to look at this? It should be no secret that the wrestling community at large hates Impact on a subconscious level. They are physically incapable of being objective about it. All right. Well, oh, see, is there, is there more to this? Oh, there's more. We know Moose is losing and he's gone. Sammy is the last hope. Not our first choice, but would definitely deserve it. All right. Well, that was a lot. That was a lot. Um, listen, I, I'm someone who doesn't, I, I talked about this earlier, but a lot of the negativity that people have about the, you know, the impact AEW working relationship, I don't necessarily have that same negativity. I think that impact is benefiting a lot from working with AEW. It's just not in an on-screen storyline kind of way. Impact reportedly did their biggest pay-per-view numbers in a long time for the Omega Rich Swan pay-per-view. Rebellion, it was called. And that's the bottom line, right? Like, why is it that when WWE, when Vince McMahon makes a move that is terrible for the fans, but good for the bottom line, people praise Vince McMahon's business acumen on finding another way to flip WWE into more millions or billions of dollars. But when other companies make moves that is good for their business, but maybe not what you expect from a storyline standpoint, it's the worst thing ever, right? Like, can we start acting like Vince McMahon is not the only person that knows how to do business, right? I mean, like, at some point, you got to give the benefit of the doubt to the people who are in these positions. They're in these positions for a reason, and their main goal is to turn a profit just like Vince McMahon. And so all the things they're doing, whether they be storyline or a TV network or a pay-per-view or putting the show on a certain day, the whole goal is to have the company turn a profit. And so nobody wants to be a part of a, of a company that's failing. We may not agree with the decisions that are happening, but you got to understand that the people in charge, the decision makers, they're trying to make money. They're trying to make money. And if they make money, the company stays around, and that's good for you and me, the wrestling fan. All right, I'll take a couple more here. All right, <clears throat> Bold Fast 94 says, Last year's Slammiversary, Impact promoted it as basically what ex-WWE talent will show up. Most fans were fine with it, but I don't like that. They're going to do that again this year. The Slammiversary promos showing Samoa Joe and now the yes sign is just needless pressure they don't need, especially if neither of them sign with Impact. It just be an unnecessary thing for fans from other promotions to laugh at Impact. Um, <clears throat> I see where you're coming from. I see where you're coming from. It, the bar for Impact to succeed has been set low. And why set yourself up for ridicule? I get that. But I also feel like this. You got to take big swings. You got to take big swings. They took a big swing by putting the belt on Tessa Blanchard. They took a big swing by booking Slammiversary last year around, uh, re you know, recently released WWE talent. They took a big swing by doing the partnership with AEW. And you got to take a big swing to make a home run, man. And this year, Slammiversary worked so well last year because they were praising the buy rates. And Slammiversary apparently worked well last year by promising new WWE talent to appear. So to me, it makes total perfect sense. Do it again. If WWE is going to do a bunch of releases in April and their 90 days is up right around Slammiversary, that leads to an opportunity for surprises. I was online and there were people tweeting and talking about uh, Slammiversary last year who had not, I had never seen them tweet about Impact before. And it was fun to be a part of that conversation. And so if you like being able to talk about your wrestling show, the wrestling show you like with other people who might not normally 
be in the conversation, then you want Impact to take in big swings and do things that are going to get fans interested who might not otherwise be checking for Impact. All right, I'll take one more. Let's make it a good one here. Let's see. All right, Terrence WK, it's just a great name. That's a great name. Terrence WK says, TW, fantastic discussion. Very much appreciated. With Callis leaving, I have little hope for impact going forward. Oh, come on. After Jared's departure, we saw Demore running the show. He might be a great indie promoter, as can be seen by his ownership and running Border City for so many years. But he gave us nothing until teaming up with Callis. Callis' ties to the industry evidently surpassed Scott's. His loss is beyond huge. My viewing goes back to the weekly TNA pay-per-views. Impact, in my opinion, tried to duplicate Lucha when it departed. Until the Good Brothers and then Kenny Omega appeared on the shows, I had little interest in having a Swan battle Omega, which was a booking nightmare. Put the belt on Moose, keep spending and bring in talent for pay-per-views, but Jesus Christ, do not think Demore can do the job alone. Impact needs marketing help not to become Border City Wrestling 2.0. I think that's a fair criticism. I think that is a fair criticism. Um, if you've seen Scott Demore in a, a an executive role before and you feel like the results haven't been good, it totally makes sense to criticize him if he's in a similar role now. Here's what I think the difference is. Anthem Entertainment has deep pockets. They just bought Access TV. They bought it from Mark Cuban. I think they partnered with Steve Harvey. Like, they have connections, and they they this is not a broke company. But I think what Impact has to demonstrate, they have to build up a fan base. They got to be able to show some numbers. So when Impact can grow some metrics that they can take to whoever at Anthem has their hand on the money faucet and say, hey, look, we need to go live touring a different city every week and <clears throat> and boost the production budget. Budget. If they have some numbers that support them doing that, trust me, the resources are there for Impact to expand greatly. But I think it would be foolish for them to try to expand from an infrastructure standpoint before they have the fan base uh, a, a demand to really support that kind of expanding. So again, what am I saying? Anthem could approve a budget for Impact to go on tour for the next year. They could they they could approve that right now. But does Impact have the fan base where they would be confident they're going to sell out, you know, arenas all over the country going on tour for the next year? Because if you're not going to do that, you're going to put yourself in a hole, right? That's what happened with 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 TNA back at the peak in what was it 2013? The uh, you know I consider that the peak of TNA. I think it was Bound for Glory 2013. AJ Styles winning the title from Bully Ray, and it was all downhill from there, right? At, they they took a look at the books and they realized that touring just was not bringing in the money that they hoped it would, and they started divesting, right? Like the money just started pulling out. Eventually, they were off Spike TV, and here we are, right? So you don't want to do that. You need, you want there to be a demand for your supply, right? And so I think that's what Impact is doing. I think that's what Scott Demore is doing. I think that's the plan that they've been following all along. Is we're gonna slowly build up interest in our product, and then we'll make bigger moves, become more visible, become a bigger company. Um, is it happening as fast as I would like? No, but I think it is happening. If you go back to look. Um, at January or uh, of last year, before you know, before the pandemic really hit, I think the last show they did was Hard to Kill. That's the one where Tessa Blanchard won the title, and 
They had a great house for that. They had a great house, great house for that. It was a big moment. There was a lot of news coverage because Tessa's all, because all Tessa's demons came back to haunt her on that one night. The press couldn't really cover it like they wanted to, and um, you know the whole situation kind of kind of blew up in their face. But in terms of the interest level in the product, I I saw it steadily climbing throughout the 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 Callis Demore regime. Uh, slowly but surely. So I think by the time they go back on the road, I think they'll be, you know, getting more people into the houses. And then, you know, eventually they'll be playing bigger houses. But, you know, we'll see at what rate that happens. But one thing you can do as a fan to help help Impact grow their audience and help the Impact Lounge grow our audience is everybody out there watching this, share this with a friend. Everybody send it to one friend. Everybody send it to one friend. And you could, you know, tag me. Be like, hey, this guy is crazy. I I can't believe this guy is, is saying all this nonsense. This guy is a fool. He's an idiot. Look how stupid this guy is. I don't care if you say that. But everybody out there share this with one friend. I really want us to get these subscriber numbers up so people look at this show, see how much uh how much we all enjoy making the show, how much you guys enjoy engaging with the show, and Again, just bringing more people into conversation, bringing more people into the fold. All right, that's it. That's all I got for today. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out to enjoy your Impact Wrestling coverage with me. I'm TW. Follow me on Twitter, at TW Talking About. Follow the Impact Lounge. Follow BQ. Um, tell a friend to tell a friend. Tag, you know, uh, share, the, share the show on social. Uh, tag me in your, in your comments and conversations. Loop me in. Let's let's chat about Impact on Twitter. All right? All right, guys. That's all I got for tonight. I'll see you soon. I'm TW. Peace.